Hey, I'd like to welcome you to another episode of Mission Matters. My name is Adam Torres, and if you'd like to be a member of our community, head on over to missionmatters.com forward slash community to apply. All right, so today I have a very special episode. We're welcoming back onto the show Jason Kennedy, who is the president and CTO over at Trackside Systems. And I'm proud to announce and say an author in our most recently released Mission Matters Business Leaders Edition um, bestselling series. Hey, Jason, first off, I just want to say welcome back to the show. Yeah, thanks. Glad to be back. All right, Jason. So uh, we we got a lot to cover today. Of course, we're going to talk about the book and what you wrote. So modernize or die eight principles for doing business the way your customers want. So we'll get into that. Of course, we're going to talk about trackside systems and the updates you have going there. I know you guys are growing like crazy. Um, and then also we got a little, a little surprise too for the audience, but we'll save that for the end. Um, but we'll start this episode the way that we start them all with what we like to call our mission matters minute. So Jason, we at Mission Matters, we amplify stories for entrepreneurs, executives, and experts. That's our mission. Jason, what mission matters to you? Well, modernizing motorsports is our, our mission. And um, you know, we try to provide all the technology and tools that racetracks need to grow and thrive. Yeah, it's uh it's uh it's a great story and it's one when I think about we talk about user experience a lot when we're talking about whether it's apps or online or other things and what you're doing is you're really creating a new user experience for many of the of the of the race car fans out there, motorsport fans out there and we'll talk about what that looks like as well. Um but I um I I don't want to assume that maybe some of our newer audience or listeners caught some of our previous work together. So maybe just start in the beginning like how did you get started? Started as an entrepreneur? So like a lot of entre entrepreneurs, I kind of fell into it. And uh, it all started for me in the early 2000s. I was yeah. part of a uh, car club that started having some events at, at racetracks. And there was a gentleman named Bob who organized those events and um, kind of reached a, a point with his family life that he couldn't really do it anymore. And so I, I stepped up, volunteered to start organizing events. And um, next thing you know, we went from one or two events a year to, to 10 to 20 to 30 to 40. And um, as, <laughs> as the time kept going on, it became a lot to manage. So we built uh, this little system for ourselves to, to help make things more efficient, organize our data and all of that called Trackside, uh, which we never intended to have as, as a product yeah. that we could be selling. Um, but then enough people kept asking us about it. You know, where'd we get our software and can they buy it? And yeah, for the longest time we said no until we finally <laughs> said, you know what, we need to start saying yes. How did you know that this was going to be a business for you? Because I feel like, um, you know, you hear some of these uh, stories, I would argue, I don't know, maybe it was in the, uh, the hobby or side hustle or side gig space for a long time with you, as you mentioned. And then at some point, like you cut the cord to, to the day to day and you and you went full time. Like, how did you know? Um, well, and, you know, that's an important question for, yeah. for all the entrepreneurs out there, because I, I know there's a lot of people that that go through a side hustle and they want to. Mm -hmm to make it their full-time thing with their passion. And, and for me, I, you know, it was a big leap. And um, I recently, recently read a book um, from someone I look up to uh, uh, Matt Higgins and his whole theme was burn the boats. Yeah. And uh, sometimes you just, you have to go all in on something and, and go for it. And uh, that's, that's what I did in 2019 and haven't looked back since. Yeah. And, uh, and it easier said than done, like burning the boats, going all in. And that, that thing that we, I think, I feel like, shoot, I, I'm still thinking, Jason, is mission matters? Like, am I supposed to be doing all these interviews? Like I'm 6,000 interviews in and I'm like, man, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. still a, a big commitment and it's still a lot. And it's one of those things where, it, you know, you, you have to make that, um, every day you walk outside the house or sit in front of your desk, if you're working at home, whatever, you have to make that commitment. And you basically have to say yes to the job every day, in my opinion, as an entrepreneur. Um, what keeps you strong and motivated and going when the times get tough, gets tough? Because I know every entrepreneur has the ups and downs. Sure. And, and a lot of what you're talking about is imposter syndrome. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of entrepreneurs have it. I still get it. It's 
you know, and I think ultimately you just have to say you're, you're where you're meant to be. Yeah. And, um, you just have to, to have faith in that. And, um, you know, it's not always easy in a day job either. So, um, everyone, you know, wants to, to look at the lifestyle of entrepreneurship of all the fancy cars and yachts and mm-hmm. houses and all that. And it's really not that at all. Um, yeah. that's, that's kind of a internet sensation type of thing, but, um, just what keeps me going is the fact that it's, it's something I own. It's something that, mm-hmm. Um, I've committed myself to, and I can't let my customers down. So I don't have a, a boss anymore, but my customers are my boss. So I just, you know, what keeps me motivated is making them happy. Yeah, it's weird. I think I think we're we're kind of um, cut from the same cloth on that one. It's like I I always say, use the analogy. I'm like, you know, I'm on this train, and it's not like I get to just you know step off because there's a lot of people depending on me. Whether it's my clients, my authors, my podcast hosts, like um, you know the people that we interview that give us their time to come on the shows. Like there's a lot of people depending on you, so you you don't get to just kind of step off that train. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, let's get a little bit into, before we get into modernize or die, um, I want to talk a little bit more about trackside systems, because I think that'll kind of set the stage um, for, you know, some of the things that you wrote. So maybe tell us a little bit about the, about some of the challenges you've seen in the industry that you, that you sought to help alleviate some of the problems and challenges for your, for your clients. So um, one thing that's kind of unique about motorsports is somehow, um, as other industries have gone on to modernize and, and do things digitally, motorsports just just sort of didn't. And um, I don't know if it's because the right solutions weren't there in order to do it, which is the gap that we're filling now mm-hmm. um, or, or what the, the case was. But at any rate, the real problem is um, inefficiency of how motorsports events are run because mm. in many cases they're still being done the way they were in the yeah. 1960s. Wow. And, um, you know, it's just show up at the gate and have your cash ready and we're going to hand you some papers and, and off you go. Um, but that process takes forever. It's, it's mm. very inefficient. Um, so our, our number one goal, uh, with any customer is to make their front gate operation as fast as and as streamlined as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, And part of that is encouraging customers to buy tickets and register for events online. Um, And the side of motorsports that a lot of people don't see is the racers and the the participants. So Mm -hmm. those racers that are going to compete, you know, they've got different paperwork they have to fill out, waivers and tech forms and and all of those things. And so when you just clog up a gate at a racetrack with everybody trying to do that all at the same time, it just, it really bogs things down. So Mm -hmm. that's where trackside comes in and digitizes all of that. All of that can be done before you even get to the racetrack. You simply Mm -hmm. scan a QR code and off you go. And um, it takes a lot to educate the customers about that too. So we have to be very supportive of, of our racetrack customers and helping, you know, to educate their racers and and spectators that they have an option to go online now. Um, But one of the early problems with that too, was that just based on the historical way things were done and some of the demographics of the age groups that are in certain areas of motorsports, um, Mm. you know, we get told all the time, well, nobody wants to do anything online. (laughs) So right in the beginning, we found a product deficiency because if everyone won't do things online, well, how do we do this at the gate? And that's why we built a whole point of sale system around that Mm -hmm. that still allows people to pay cash and do things at the gate, but at least much more efficiently than they were before. Yeah. And as you go further and further down this line of modernization for the, for the tracks and, and um, like, what's been the result? Because I feel like sometimes, and I'll, I'll pick on myself, like sometimes I don't, as a business owner, I don't know what I don't know. So I'm guessing that I'm probably saying, well, some things don't work like that only because, and this is the kiss of death, right? We've always done things this way, or we've tried that before and it didn't work. And we're not like, we, we have this crystal ball, right? Like that things don't change. So when you told me that, I'm probably thinking to myself, like, I bet you there was a tipping point at some point when people did start and do start doing things online. Like what's been the result? I'm just curious. Uh, so that can vary dramatically in, in different areas yeah. of the country and, and the demographics associated with that and, and everything. But, 
you know, by and large, uh, once the the racers and fans are realize that they have an option to go online, yeah, it's, most track owners are surprised at how many people are willing to do that. And mm-hmm. I I think that the reason for that is literally everywhere else around you in the world has an option to buy something online before you go somewhere. You know, whether yeah. that's concert tickets, airline tickets. I mean, you can't just show up at a concert and expect to get in. You can't show up at an airport and think you're just going to buy a ticket and go somewhere. It doesn't yeah. work that way anymore. So yeah. um, people have these experiences in other parts of their life and their mm-hmm. their daily activity. And I, I don't know if for some reason, you know, some of the people in motorsports think that no one does anything except racing <laughs> as much <laughs> as we'd like to to think that, you know, we're that dedicated to racing, we do do other things too. So, um, you know, once they actually embrace it Mm -hmm. and the track helps communicate with their customers, we, we see a very high, uh, Mm -hmm. uptick in online sales well beyond what they ever thought. I mean, sometimes 40% is a big number, but sometimes we get some that are 60 and 70% and that that's a much better number. But just based off of what you're telling me, the original problem or original challenge that you were trying to alleviate, which is how do you create a better user experience? Like people just literally getting into their seats or or registered if they're a racer or all these other things, um, even even any percentage is going to speed that up. So like either way, like the regardless of the adoption rate, it still increases. And I would imagine it, it increases like satisfaction. Then you can add things like, I don't know, reward programs, all these other things. Like Like, am I off on that? No, you're, you're spot on. And, uh, you know, Trackside has a, a loyalty point system built into it that the tracks can, they don't have to use it, but it's an option. Yeah. And so uh, we have some customers that have started to use that and it, it's still a new concept. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, we're still, you know, kind of seeing what works with that in some cases, but we have um, a couple of customers in their second or third year of uh, loyalty points and they see a good return from it. That it wow. works. I mean, that's why McDonald's does it of all things. And of course. You know, just, it, it's so, so prevalent everywhere that, uh, you know, our whole vision is we want to equip these racetracks with the tools to succeed in business mm-hmm. um, the way that, that every other industry is doing. And so mm-hmm. someone needed to step in and do it. And so why not us? Yeah. So um, that's great. And thank you for sharing that story. And I want, I want to get a little bit into the book because now that this just ties right in. So Modernize or Die, Eight Principles for Doing Business the Way Your Customers Want. So for everybody watching, um, we're not going to go through all eight. I'm going to read them pretty fast right now, but then uh, just to give you a flavor for it. And we'll pick out a couple of them. But hey, you want all eight, you want to dig in, obviously pick up a copy of the book. We do sell books and we'll have a link in the show notes. Shameless plug there, Jason. <laughs> um, all right. So some the the uh, the, the the top eight. So be your own first customer. Be the one to solve the problem. See your business through your customer's lens. Uh, do business the way your customers want you to. Um, foster customer loyalty. Uh, your email list is gold. Uh, make decisions with data. Uh, don't overlook cash flow. Um, so were these steps, I'm, I, as I kind of went through your work and I've been waiting to ask this question to you, were these steps things that you kind of knew going into entrepreneurship or the, or when you kind of, when you sat down to get this written, were these things that you kind of looked back and you're like, yeah, these are some of the things that I wish I'd known, or maybe like a combination, like get, let us inside your thinking and how you came up with this topic. Yeah. So most of those principles are things I learned the hard way. <laughs> uh, so I, you know, see I, everybody that listening, this is like the pick on yourself show over here. We're not, you know, this isn't about, <laughs> Hey, entrepreneurs that have made it. It's about, Hey, we learned the hard way too. Go ahead, Jason. I just always like to pull that out because I appreciate the humility. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it, you know, early on with our uh, events business is where most of those concepts came from. And, mm-hmm. you know, we didn't grow from one or two, to, to 40 or so events a year, just by happenstance, we had to, to have our little, you know, fumbles and stumbles and little issues and, and all of that. And, um, mm-hmm. and we did, and that's where most of that came from. I mean, I had, uh, some amount of experience with entrepreneurship, uh, in the tech space, mm-hmm. uh, before really being in the motorsport space, but they're, they're very different industries. And, um, so yeah, most of those come from real life experiences of problems that we had to solve as we we grew a, a large driving school operation. Hmm. 
And so let's, I want to pick out, I want to pick out a few of these, um, be your own first customer. So let me into that one. Yeah. So when we were deciding to take Trackside to market, um, you know, obviously we built it as an internal tool for auto interest and that proved to be more valuable than we ever could have imagined because mm -hmm. I think, especially for tech startups, one of the big challenges is how do you get that first proof of concept and that first um, customer that's, mm -hmm. that's willing to try your product and accept the, you know, the quirks and issues that are going to come from a first generation product, right? Yeah. So um, in our case, we were able to be our own first customer. And I think there are opportunities to do that uh, mm -hmm. in different capacities and in different industries. But, uh, you know, we, we developed an incredibly deep understanding of the needs of a motorsports organization mm -hmm. by being one and by building a system around that. Um, you know, if we weren't in the motorsports space and a lot of our competitors are not, yeah. um, it shows in the product, you know, the, the fitness for purpose of the product really, really shines through and it makes it a much easier sell and it makes it go much more smoothly for your first real customers. Mm, that's a lot like as we are building Mission Matters. Um, and when we were doing those initial books, the reason why we did the initial books was to promote and to bring together our community into those books. And and it really was just a promotion tool for Mission Matters in the beginning. And that's what we thought it always would be. But we were, we were really testing the product. And especially that first book, man, that was, a, we thought it was going to be a couple months in, a year and a half later, I think it took us to do it. But we were, you know, working out the kinks of the product and everything else and which made it all different going forward because again we were thinking we, we were able to design it around our needs and what we'd want and then we knew how our our clients would also be as well so i can i can definitely empathize on that one and um so looking at that, I mean, this one, we're going to take these out of order, of course, um, but um, making decisions with data. So now you have just to kind of continue the narrative. So now you have all of this deep understanding. Obviously, you know, there's never a point where you stop trying to make it better. That's a given. But you have this deep understanding, like you have all this data, like what's next in your process? So using data is not a new concept in, in business, but it's, it's one that's been difficult because mm -hmm. if you don't have a system that's capturing the right data points in your business, it's very hard to make data driven decisions, obviously. So by having the right tools that capture the right data points at different parts of your, your business process, you're enabling yourself to have better visibility into what's going on. And that, <clears throat> that concept mm -hmm. is easy to understand um, on the surface, but, when you really dig into it, you know, you could have an event in motorsports and say, oh, that felt like it went really well. And those stands look really full. Right. Um, and then you look at the numbers and you're like, oh, well, maybe it wasn't that great. Or, you know, compare it to something else. Um, you know, one of the old, uh, old things that some of the track owners we work with have told me they would do during larger events is they would go walk through their parking lot and they would look and see where all the license plates were from, from all the cars in there to try to figure out where people were coming from. Um, so if you think <laughs> that's, that's pretty funny, right? Like, so yeah, that is funny. Around. That's cool though. Like, and who would know that nuance? That's really cool. Yeah. So they're walking around and like taking a tally sheet. Okay. There's one from Ohio, one from Indiana, <laughs> you know, whatever they're doing. And uh, if you use a system like Trackside, you just instantly have that at your fingertips. Nobody has wow. to go do that. Nobody has to go miscount something or say, oh, it's too hot out here. I don't feel like walking through all these cars or, you know, did 10 people come in this van or did one person come in this van? Yeah. You know, there's so much error that can come from that or if it was a rental car or whatever. Um, but with Trackside, you have the real data of where people are coming from. So when you're trying to make decisions of mm -hmm. where should I buy advertising or how do I make marketing decisions and things like that, you have real data to work with and it's yeah. not this flawed you know, kind of anecdotal sort of stuff. Yeah, it's great. Um, so let's look into this one and this to me. I mean, I, I talk about this all the time. And for people that have been, the reason I'm pulling this one out, and you don't know this, Jason, but my long-term listeners um, that that are glued to this know anytime I get to talk about an email list, like I just makes me smile from ear to ear because I that my biggest regret in business is that we were probably three years in the business, a media company, right? 1,500 plus episodes at that point. And, um, and we didn't, we didn't make use of our 
email list. We had a list. We didn't send out a single newsletter. I kicked myself for that. Like that was wasted time. And obviously we're in the media business, like wasted eyeballs, right? Our business. Um, but what what's the significant of the email list to you? So one thing we noticed in our driving school program very early on is mm -hmm. <clears throat> there's kind of a cycle to it. So um, what will happen is you might get somebody that starts driving in or racing in a series or driving in a certain program. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe they're in their late teens, early 20s. Um, maybe they still live at home or maybe they're mm -hmm. on their own, but they've got more disposable income. You know, yeah. kids and a family and a house maybe haven't happened yet. All those sorts mm -hmm. of things. Um, Life hasn't hit them yet. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> right. They're, they still get to play. Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> What happens is, though, then, you know, there's, you know, <coughs> excuse me, marriages, yeah, um, right. houses, kids, whatever life, you know, life, life <laughs> happens. And then so those people kind of disappear for a while. But then, yeah. you know what, they end up coming back. And wow. it's because you kept them on your email list and they're still staying current and kind of following what's going on with your mm. motorsports organization, whether it's you know, a more educational and recreational driving school like we have, or whether it's yeah. a competitive race series, that's, that's how these things work. And we see it time and time again. So it's, how do you stay in touch with these people? And so when somebody's on cycle of participating in the mm -hmm. motorsports events and someone else is off cycle and they're not, then, you know, oftentimes those will flip. So it's like, how do you keep your spots full in mm -hmm. your events? Well, it's by building that list. And, when you use trackside, that just happens automatically. So when wow. somebody signs up for something, they're in your database, they're in your system, that's your private database, and you can market and remarket, you know, to those customers. And the same concept applies for fans. So, mm -hmm. you know, fans are a little more fickle because, you know, they don't have to spend thousands of dollars on a race car, right? Like they yeah, yeah, of come course. and go as they please, but you know, staying in touch with people, letting them know what's going on at your racetrack, give them yeah. reasons to come back. Maybe you're putting on some unique show or something. Mm -hmm. um, but just building that list, you know, historically and just growing and growing and growing casts a wider and wider net every year that you add yeah. people to that database. And who wouldn't want that? For sure. And it's and it and it also builds to me when I think about like what we what I missed in the beginning was it kind of starts to build that brand affinity right for the for even for the, you know the racetrack in this case um, and for and memories right because some of those you know thinking about like the cycle so if I if we continue that cycle I'm guessing possibly some of those um, individuals who come back their kids are going to get older and maybe they'll want to race in their teenage years and maybe that then the cycle starts again assuming that they take yeah. interest and it, especially if their parents are taking them to the track in the first place then the likelihood that if dad raced and you know is part of that culture maybe the a teenage you know daughter or son may want to like that all just kind of keeps it in the same ecosystem and that email list keeps you in front of them, whether they have the time and they're just opening the email and thinking about, man, I wish I could make it out, but I'm busy or like, you know, whatever. It keeps them in the game, right? Right. Yeah. And layered on top of that in motorsports, um, you know, a key part of the business model is sponsorships and partnerships, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. the bigger your database of, of eyes on your track and your content, mm -hmm. um, the more you have to offer a partner that may come along too. So you can tell them, hey, we've got this many people that we can reach digitally in addition to people at the track. Mm, so it's just, it's even another pos another profit center too. So that, right. I mean, all right. So um, last one that I'm going to pull out, at least from the writing that is, um, is to uh, foster customer loyalty. And where I want to go with this one, Jason, is I want to go a little bit deeper into the, you, you mentioned in the beginning, but a little bit deeper into the rewards um, systems. And I know that for everybody watching, maybe you don't own a racetrack or maybe that, but I, I, the reason why I want Jason to go further into this, number one is because he's been working in that space for a long time, but I challenge everybody that's watching this or, or listening to this to think about how to apply some of these ideas or some of the things that Jason's seen through his clients in your own business. Like when I read this and I was thinking about, it, I'm like, man, how do I create a loyalty program at Mission Matters? Like that's my challenge for myself, for everybody listening. I challenge you to think about how you can kind of take some of this knowledge Jason gives us and, and apply it to your own business. So no pressure, Jason. Um, but uh, like what are what what's not just the benefits, but what are some of the things you've seen and why is it so important? 
Yeah, so there's a lot of data out there about um, loyalty types of programs. And so I've, I've attended trade shows for not just the motorsports industry, but other industries. I've read different uh, case studies that have been done on this topic, and, and I've really tried to educate myself thoroughly on it uh, in order to, to figure out the best way to implement it. <clears throat> and the, the moral of the story that I would distill it down to is a little bit goes a long way. Mm. And the easiest way to look at that is, is a spending based program. So if you have a, especially a consumer oriented Mm -hmm. business, um, you know, even if you give the equivalent of one or 2% back, you know, as, as a rebate or a coupon, Mm -hmm. um, that goes a long way and, and customers appreciate that. I mean, in this day and age of, of prices going up on everything and inflation um, and all of that, if a customer has an option to do X or Y um, mm-hmm. and and X has a loyalty points program and Y doesn't, they're going to mm-hmm. do X. Yeah. And they just feel that, you know, the organization or company they're doing business with is, mm-hmm. is making a commitment to them in addition to them making a commitment to the company. And mm-hmm. it, it's really kind of an emotional thing um, in a sense. And, <clears throat> Like I said, it doesn't have to be a ton. So it can be after you spend a hundred dollars, you get a one dollar coupon back. Or mm-hmm. you know, maybe it's maybe it's a little more, a little less. In some cases, it depends on what you're selling and what margins you have available to work with. But it also doesn't have to be directly monetary. It can also mm-hmm. be where you accumulate points for doing different activities, whether that's purchasing something or engaging mm-hmm. in some way, and then. Maybe there's prizes available. It could be entries in a drawing. It could be yeah. free product. It could be gift cards. It could be any number of different things. But mm-hmm. uh, you know, just don't underestimate. You know that doing something mm-hmm. is better than nothing. I guess is is what I would say. So even if you think you can't really afford to do much in a loyalty program, yeah, that's okay. It doesn't have to be a ton. Yeah. It's interesting too, because I think about, um, and I, because in, in preparing for that question for you, I was thinking, I went back and I thought about like the programs that I'm either a part of or that hit me most. And this is just a personal thing that I'm not saying there's one way to do it or not, but one, um, one company, so we do a lot of B2B. So one of the company that we, companies that we purchase a lot of audio, like voiceovers or things like that for, for our production, um, they donate a portion of it to this um, nonprofit called, I think, tree nation off the top of my head and they use so let's say we spend a hundred dollars with them they might use like two dollars of that like you're saying a couple percent to buy trees and so there is yeah. actually a mission matters forest out there and we have like trees that are named nice. and that we see when they get planted and things like that and that adds it so now every time i do business with that company i've you know if i have to exactly like you said x if i have to choose between one company and another all, all things being equal assuming the products are similar and you know pretty good and uh, and they're and they're delivering on their promise i'm going to plant a tree all day long like for sure. I don't, I don't even think about it to the point to where they have me so loyal that I haven't shopped their pricing or anything in probably two years. Instead, all I do when we spend money with them is I'm looking at, oh, we got X amount of trees now. This is awesome. And, I've, and, I'm, and I'm seeing our, our CO2 like carbon you know, offset that we're doing based off of, off of planting those trees. So the reason I'm going so in depth in that is because there's ways to do it. Like there's ways to do it and there's ways that don't necessarily cost a lot of money. Like that, that particular loyalty program I talked about right there, they, of course they have a B2B division of it. So that's something people could sign up if they wanted to, or there's plenty of other ones. So um, I just think it's a, it's a great idea. And if somebody's not doing it, I think that should be on the list like that, that can increase brand loyalty for sure. Sure. And, and some of it's just about engaging with your customer mm-hmm. in any capacity. I mean, anything that it's not just a one way transactional yeah. type of a sale is good. Yeah. Well, Jason, I just have to say um, it has been great having you back on the show um, and, and getting into this. Are we going to are we going to, you know, spoil it a little, little bit of the project we've been working on a bit? What do you think? I'm in if you are. I don't know why we wouldn't. Come on. I'll let you announce it, man. I always get to have all the fun. I'm going to let you announce it. All right. So um, we're, we're working on a, a collaboration project, and I'm going to tag some of you that, that I'd like to participate on LinkedIn here. Um, 
but we want to write a book all about motorsports. So I was very thrilled with with how my chapter turned out of, of the Mission Matters book. I just participated in, and um, I've never seen anything that kind of lifts the curtain so you can see the behind the scenes business of motorsports. And I think that there's a lot of great information out there, um, a lot of uh, customers that are um, customers of Trackside and other colleagues I work with in the motorsport space. I, I really would like to get the word out there and help people really understand what makes motorsports tick. And so we're going to try to put together an entire book of a variety of authors from all different walks of, of motorsports about all that. Oh man, I'm I'm so thrilled about this. And then uh, and my it'll be my first time out to PRI. Come on, how many days do we got? I don't I don't have it up. It's like what 70 something days now. I'm, I'm starting so, yeah. I'm starting the countdown internally with my team to to go into it. I'm like there's a, it's a huge, huge racing <laughs> event, industry event, and uh, I'm excited for it and excited to meet all the all the new authors as we start creating content. And this will be we're in the motorsport business. I'm so pumped and excited. I was talking to the team and I'm like, you know what? Um, as we start creating this content, we're going to add another section to the missionmatters.com website. So there'll be a motorsports tab. Like we're going to, you know us, Jason, we don't do it small. We're going to do as much as we can yeah. to get the word out, to make a whole lot of noise and to get involved because that's what, I mean, that's my favorite thing. And I grew up for everybody that's watching. I don't talk about this too often, but I grew up in that industry. My dad owned an auto body shop growing up and I'm from Detroit. So I grew up going to the Woodward dream cruises and going to all the things that that like I was in, I'm in the car culture growing up my entire life. So um, to get back to it, like if somebody had had me going back to the email list, I don't know if this is going too far back earlier in the conversation, but if I'd have been on somebody's email list, I got drugged back into motorsports. I'm back. Come on. Where am I going to a race? So. <laughs> There you go. Oh, man. Well, Jason, again, it has been wonderful having you back on the show. Looking forward to continuing to work with you to promote this book, of course. Also, the next book we're going to be doing on motorsports and, and beyond. Um, if somebody wants to follow up and learn more about Trackside or connect with you or your team, what's the best way for them to do that? So TracksideSystems.com uh, has everything you need to know about Trackside. Um, if you'd like to connect with me, I'm on LinkedIn. I don't really do any other social media besides that. So I'm pretty easy to find on LinkedIn. So hit me up there. Fantastic. And we'll put we'll put all the uh, all, all those links in the show notes so that our uh, audience can just click on the links and head right on over. And speaking of the audience, if this is your first time with Mission Matters or engaging in an episode, we're all about bringing on business owners, entrepreneurs, executives and experts and having them share their mission, the reason behind their mission, you know, why they do what they do, what gets them up and fired up in the morning to get up out there and out their bed and make a difference. Um, if that's the type of content that sounds interesting or fun or exciting to you, we welcome you. Hit that subscribe button. We have many more mission-based individuals coming up on the line, and we don't want you to miss a thing. Jason, again, thank you so much for coming back on the show. Until the next time. All right. Thanks, Adam.